the labor movement in America has had a bumpy ride. The morning sun stirs the nation's workmen. The first recorded strike in North America occurred in the early 1600s, and the first labor union was formed not long after the Revolutionary War. The first general strike occurred in Philadelphia, where 20,000 workers in both the private and public sector went on strike for better wages and a 10-hour workday. After three weeks on strike, the workers got their demands. Since unions and strikes were mostly illegal, violence was often used by employers. For example, during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, federal troops, National Guard members and local police were deployed all over the country to force 100,000 striking railroad workers back to work, leading to violence and at least 100 deaths. But the labor movement kept growing, with many more strikes taking place and the creation of the American Federation of Labor, the United Mine Workers of America, and the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, major unions that still exist today. After decades of political activism by unions, the Department of Labor was established in 1913 to give organized labor a voice in the president's cabinet and to represent ordinary wage earners. Only a year later, strikes, boycotts and labor unions were made legal under federal law by the Clayton Act. The real breakthrough for unions occurred when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Wagner Act, which gave employees the right to join a union without the fear of firing, discrimination or other intimidation tactics used by employers. And the bill established the National Labor Relations Board to oversee democratic union elections, settle labor disputes and prevent unfair labor practices. The law also defined two ways that union security contracts could be set up. The first way is called an agency shop, and it means that all employees in a unionized workplace must pay dues to the union, which represents them, or be fired. But the employees are not required to actually join the union. The second option is called an open shop, where employees in a unionized workplace are not required to join the union or pay dues, but the union must still represent the employees as if they were full members when negotiating wages and benefits. The Wagner Act helped the labor movement tremendously, and only three years after its passage, union membership had doubled. Only ten years after the Wagner Act, one in three workers were members of a union. As unionization increased, inequality decreased. In 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act gave states the ability to enact laws that prohibit the agency shop and only allow the open shop. These laws are known as right-to-work laws and states with these laws are known as right-to-work states. Within 10 years of the Taft-Hartley Act, 17 states enacted right-to-work laws, and today, 27 states have right-to-work laws on the books. Workers in these states can have a union representing them at the workplace without having to join the union or pay dues, effectively hurting the union's economic situation and making unionization harder, but retaining workers' freedom of choice. In the 70s and 80s, the US went through tough economic times. Deindustrialization caused the loss of thousands of good paying, unionized and stable jobs throughout the Rust Belt in major industrial cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo and many others. That combined with high inflation, slow economic growth and the rising competitiveness of countries like Japan and Germany caused corporate profits to drop by 50%, leading many companies to look for ways to lower costs. 
One way this could be done was by reducing wages and benefits. As unions prevented this method of cost cutting, employers needed a way to decrease their power. Starting in the 70s, employers began lobbying politicians at all levels of government to loosen labor laws. The Supreme Court also legalized many anti-union tactics. One anti-union tactic that was almost always used is called captive audience meetings and involves all employees being forced to attend meetings where their supervisor will tell them that forming a union will only hurt the employees themselves. Unions are not legally allowed to respond to any statements during these meetings, even if the statements are false. Employers also started hiring anti-union consulting firms to help them defeat unions. Employers even began using outright illegal tactics like firing or threatening workers who supported unions. These tactics are illegal, but the punishment for doing so is extremely small. No fines are given out and no employer goes to jail. If a worker was illegally fired, they must be reinstated, but they do not receive economic compensation for the harm inflicted by their illegal treatment. This has meant that it can sometimes be profitable for companies to go outside the law to stop a union from forming. It is entirely up to the National Labor Relations Board to bring charges against illegal behavior, and workers cannot sue their employer if the board decides not to file charges. The board consists of five members who are directly chosen by the president. Neoliberal presidents like Ronald Reagan chose conservative members to serve on the board, and these new business-friendly members were more likely to be hesitant to file charges for illegal behavior. Since the 90s, a new phenomenon has emerged. The gig economy. Workers in the gig economy are not legally classified as employees by the companies they work for, but instead as independent contractors. In the 90s, only 10% of workers were employed in the gig economy, but today around a third of the workforce, or almost 60 million workers, are involved in the gig economy. You've probably interacted with the gig economy yourself. Companies such as Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, DoorDash and Amazon all employ gig workers to provide some of their services. Many large companies are also looking to enter the gig economy. Since workers in the gig economy are not classified as employees, they don't get the same labor protections as actual legal employees. They don't have the right to a minimum wage or health insurance, and they don't have the right to join a union or go on strike. All of these different factors have over the years combined to weaken the labor movement and unions. Following World War II, union membership declined year by year, but following the increase in anti-union tactics deployed by employers in the 70s and 80s, the rate of unionization decline got faster. The decline in private sector unionization was even faster than the total decline suggesting that anti-union tactics are mostly deployed by private companies and not as much by government agencies. Union membership in the public sector has been consistently sitting at around 35% since the first reliable data became available in the 80s. It's not that Americans don't want to join a union, in fact, Almost half of the workforce say that they would vote yes to joining one. But in 2009, only 0.07% of workers even participated in a union election. And in more than 4 out of 10 union elections, the employer is charged with an unfair labor practice. In 30% of union elections, employers are charged with threatening or retaliating against workers 
And in 20% of elections, employers are charged with illegally firing an employee for union activity. Companies also spend hundreds of millions of dollars on hiring consulting firms that will help them defeat a union. Many large employers like Walmart, Amazon and Home Depot have long been actively fighting union efforts, sometimes even going outside the law to prevent employees from unionizing. We are not anti-union, but we are not neutral either. We do not believe unions are in the best interest of our customers, our shareholders, or most importantly, our associates. While we understand unions work in some industries, they would conflict with our culture, customer obsession, and direct working relationship. Again, as union membership declined, inequality increased along with it. This graph shows us how the income of a person in the bottom 90% of wage earners and the income of a person in the top 1% has changed since 1947. In the beginning, the salary of the bottom 90% actually grew faster than for the richest. But following the union busting that started in the 70s, the wealthy quickly began increasing their income faster than the bottom 90%. This other graph shows us that even though workers keep getting more and more productive, their hourly pay no longer increases significantly, even as they get more done in that hour. A recent study suggests that if the same share of workers were unionized today as in 1979, wages would be almost 8% higher for a normal middle class American worker. After decades of the American labor movement losing power, there is now some evidence that we could see a turnaround. The last time the public were more supportive of labor unions was in the 60s, and today, half of non-union workers would like to join a union. And President Biden is being praised by some as the most pro-union president in decades. Earlier this year, an effort to unionize almost 6,000 workers at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama received national attention, as well as endorsements from President Biden and from independent, Democratic and Republican lawmakers in Washington and elsewhere. While the workers voted down the union, the National Labor Relations Board recommended a new election because Amazon used unfair labor practices to stop the union. Not long after the failed union attempt in Alabama, the Teamsters, a union with 1.3 million members, voted to make unionizing Amazon a top priority for the union. Also in Alabama, coal miners have been on strike for over five months now the first major Alabama coal miner strike in decades. Nurses in Massachusetts have also been on strike for half a year now and may break the record for the longest nurses strike in state history. More than 1,000 workers at Nabisco, the company which produces Oreos, Chips Ahoy and other snacks, are also on strike, calling for an end to shifts which sometimes supposedly last 16 hours and award little overtime pay. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you another time.